Thank you so much. It is a joy and a privilege uh, to be with you this afternoon. Uh, I am uh, thankful, so thankful for Greenville Seminary and uh, particularly its acquiring Law College Press so that uh, the work of, of publishing uh, the writings of and about our 18th and 19th century American Presbyterian forefathers can uh, go forth with even uh, greater zeal and uh, efficiency and uh, a greater uh, reach around the world. And so it's a, a joy uh, to see the first hardback uh, copies of, of some Log College Press titles uh, or the giveaways. Uh, so excited to see those finally uh, in print. Um, I want to talk to you tonight, uh, today, this afternoon, about a man named John Layton Wilson. Uh, Layton Wilson is how uh, he was known during his lifetime, and I'm going to be using uh, that, that name, Layton, or Dr. Wilson, or Wilson. Uh, but I want us to start on March 4th, 1831. The 53-year-old Dr. John Holt Rice, the first professor of theology at Union Theological Seminary in Virginia, he mailed an envelope on that day uh, to the 34-year-old Professor Charles Hodge at Princeton Theological Seminary. The two men were friends. Uh, inside this envelope uh, was a draft of an overture regarding foreign missions that John Holt Rice had dictated to his secretary from his sickbed about six months before he passed away. He wanted the professors at Princeton to look over this draft, this overture, and to submit it to the upcoming General Assembly on his behalf. In this overture, Dr. Rice lamented how little the Presbyterian Church in the United States of America had done directly to that point in its 42-year history regarding foreign missions to spread Christ's gospel to all the world. And in this overture, he set forth a series of resolutions, actions that he believed would help to rectify this situation. Specifically, Dr. Rice wanted the Presbyterian Church to set up its own committee of foreign missions and not merely outsource its missions efforts to the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, the ABC-FM. This overture was submitted to the General Assembly, and as good Presbyterians, uh, the assembly voted to refer it to a committee uh, that would uh, bring back the next year recommendation. Uh, well, unfortunately, the 1832 General Assembly uh, voted not to change the way that it conducted missions, nor to take any opinion uh, on the principles contained in the report, the recommendation of the committee. It wouldn't be until the 1835 and 1836 General Assemblies that the substance of Dr. Rice's resolutions were adopted, and foreign missions uh, would finally begin to be conducted directly by the General Assembly. And if you're familiar with your American Presbyterian Church history, you know that the years 1835, 1836, 1837, right, that's the height of the old school, new school controversy. And, and this question of, of how will we do missions and who will do missions uh, was at the, the center of those disagreements. When Dr. Rice mailed uh, that envelope, those resolutions to Dr. Hodge, a 22-year-old young man from South Carolina was just beginning uh, his training as a part of the first graduating class at the newly formed Columbia Theological Seminary in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, by the time that the General Assembly uh, approved Dr. Rice's resolutions and, and formed its own uh, board of foreign missions, this young man who had just been married uh, was now a missionary in Africa having been sent by, ironically enough, the ABC-FM. Uh, but in due time, uh, he would become an assistant secretary of the Board of Foreign Missions of the Presbyterian Church in the USA. Uh, he would eventually become the secretary of the Committee of Foreign Missions of the Presbyterian Church in the United States, the Southern Presbyterian Church. And of course, I'm referring, this young man, I'm referring to John Layton Wilson. Uh, I want this morning to introduce, this afternoon, to introduce him to you and then to draw some lessons about missions from his ministry. But let me just say from the outset uh, that it is impossible for me to convey all uh, that, that you uh, could know or need to know uh, about this father of Presbyterian missions in 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, he was a large man in every way. He was large in stature. Uh, he was large in intellectual and vocational capacity. Uh, he was large in spirit. He lived a large life. He was large in stature. He, he stood six feet two inches tall. He was broad-shouldered and full-chested. He was large in intellectual and vocational capacity. He was a pioneer foreign missionary. He was a church planner, an evangelist, 
He was a pastor, a preacher. He was a linguist, reducing to writing two African languages. Uh, He was an ethnologist, writing what David Livingstone uh, said was the best book ever written on everything you could have known and wanted to know about Western Africa. Uh, He was a naturalist. He was the the first Westerner uh, to discover the existence of the gorilla and sent the first gorilla skeleton uh, to a natural history museum, I believe, in England. Uh, He was a local doctor treating malaria and other illnesses. He was a statesman as a missionary. He had dealings with both the British and the French governments. In 1851, as we'll see, his pamphlet on the slave trade was instrumental in ending the slave trade along the the western coast of Africa. Uh, He was an administrator of foreign and sometimes national missions. He was an author of books and articles and pamphlets and missions magazines and newspapers and letters upon letters upon letters upon letters. Uh, He was a large man in in all that the Lord gifted him to do. He was large in spirit. He was full of faith, full of love for Jesus, full of love for the lost, love for the poor across all racial lines, full of kindness and humility, endurance and courage, full of conviction and belief. And above all, he was full of wisdom. Uh, Charles Hodge told another pastor that Dr. Leighton Wilson was the wisest man in the Presbyterian church and had more of the apostolic spirit than anyone I ever knew. When Leighton Wilson left the North to return home at the beginning of the war between the states, Charles Hodge remarked, the wisest man among us has gone out. Leighton Wilson lived a large life. He lived to the age of 77. He lived a life full of useful service to the Lord, to the world, to the church. One who served with him in the foreign missions office put it like this. He served the great cause which the master made great and laid upon the hands and hearts of his church under a worldwide commission and a precious promise of his own presence. I think Dr. and Mrs. Wilson had as large and loving interest in this cause as any persons I have ever known. We can divide the life of Leighton Wilson into four seasons. First, his youth and preparation for ministry, 1809 to 1833. Second, his missionary labors on the coast of Western Africa in Liberia and the Gabon, 1834 to 1852. Third, his service as assistant secretary of foreign missions in New York City for the old school Presbyterian Church, 1853 to 1861. And then finally, his service in South Carolina and in Maryland as the Secretary of Foreign Missions for the Southern Presbyterian Church, 1861 to 1884, a year and a half before he died. For over 50 years, he devoted his life to bringing the gospel to the nations. And unfortunately, like the vast majority of our American Presbyterian forefathers and foremothers, he is almost entirely forgotten. It's amazing. I don't want to take anything away from John Payton. I read John Payton to my children, but is it not amazing how probably everyone in this room has heard of John Payton? And yet the exact same century, both foreign pioneer foreign missionaries, and yet raise your hand if you know have ever heard of John Layton Wilson, right? Just a handful, just a handful. A prophet is not without honor except in his own country. Is what it often seems with these American Presbyterian forefathers. And so it is my joy to, to open up his life and his ministry to you. Uh, we're just going to scratch the surface, as I said. Uh, and so if you want more detail, I do encourage you, eventually at some point this year, Log College Press is going to be uh, publishing the memoirs of John Layton Wilson, published by Hampton DeBose, a missionary to China, as well as a volume of his selected writings. You can also find a chapter on Wilson and Henry Alexander White's 1911 volume, Southern Presbyterian Leaders. Uh, You can find a chapter in John Miller Wells' 1936 Southern Presbyterian Worthies, as well as a book that is for sale here, if there are any copies left, David Calhoun's 2020 Swift and Beautiful, a collection of sketches about foreign missionaries. Also, uh, Southern Presbyterian scholar Erskine Clark, about a decade ago, wrote an entire book about uh, Jane and Leighton Wilson and their African mission entitled By the River of Waters, By the Rivers of Waters. And so I commend that to you as well. So let's think first, who was Leighton Wilson and what did he do? Or, or better said, what did God do through him? Wilson's ancestors were godly Scotch-Irish Presbyterians who arrived on the shores of America in 1734, settling in Williamsburg County, South Carolina. 
Eventually, some of those early families made their way up the Black River to form a community called Salem, uh, northeast of Sumter, South Carolina, in Lee County, uh, just north of what is now the town of Maysville, about 170 miles southeast of Greenville. Uh, if Mel, is Mel Duncan here? If Mel Duncan were here, he would uh, say what uh, Dr. Hamilton said, you should be embarrassed if you don't know uh, where those cities are in, uh, in South Carolina. I, for one, am embarrassed. I don't know exactly where those cities are. I could find them on a map. Uh, they're, they're somewhere in this great state. God sent Leighton uh, into the world uh, on March 25th, 1809, the fifth of eight children born to William and Jane James Wilson. They lived in a house called Pine Grove. Uh, William, Leighton's father, was a planner by trade, a faithful elder in the Mount Zion Presbyterian Church. Leighton grew up a country boy on his father's farm before it became a full-fledged plantation. Uh, he grew up with all the skills and all the strength and joy that a childhood in the field and the forest affords. But his childhood was also marked by grief, as his mother died at the age of 37 when he was eight years old, and William was left a widower with seven children from ages 15 to three. Leighton was educated at a school near his father's plantation, and then in Springville near Florence, and then at the age of 16, he went to Winsboro to Mount Zion High School. The next logical step in his education would have been uh, to attend South Carolina College in Columbia. Uh, but when the time came to make the college decision, uh, the president of that flagship institution was a man named Thomas Cooper. He was a militant Unitarian. Uh, and so in 1827, Leighton's father sent him not to South Carolina College, but to Union College in Schenectady, New York, where he entered the junior class. And God's providence not only was Leighton guarded from heresy, uh, but he also was able to prevent, begin a friendship with a, a young man named John Bailey Adger from Charleston. Uh, Adger eventually went to study at Princeton Seminary. Uh, he was instrumental uh, in Wilson's decision to go to the mission field. Both men would become foreign missionaries. Adger went to Armenia, and both men would become pillars of the Southern Presbyterian Church. Leighton graduated from Union College in 1829. He returned to South Carolina that fall. We don't have a lot of information about how the Lord led him to the ministry, but we do know that, that when he returned from Union College, he spent time studying under his uncle, the Reverend Dr. J Robert Wilson James, uh, who was pastoring the Salem Black River Presbyterian Church. And then he spent some time teaching at a small school in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, uh, while studying theology with Dr. Aaron Leland who eventually became a professor of theology at Columbia Seminary. Azure tells us in a letter that Wilson's religious affections were at a low ebb post-graduation. Uh, he had become a communion member uh, as a youth, uh, but at least one of his biographers thinks that, that even after college he was not yet converted. Whatever the case might be, it's clear that God graciously used the preaching of the Word to awaken him more deeply to his own sinfulness and to eternity to give him a feeling sense of the love of God in Jesus Christ. He was particularly impacted by a series of evening revival services at the Circular Church in Charleston, which at the time was pastored by Benjamin Morgan Palmer, the uncle in the namesake of uh, the famous Southern Presbyterian pastor in Columbia and New Orleans. And so these, these years immediately post-college uh, became a season of great spiritual growth uh, for the young man as the Lord prepared his heart for the work of ministry by humbling him, uh, by rooting him more deeply in grace and assurance and making the gospel come alive to him. Perhaps you too have had an experience like that. You were converted in early age. Uh, you knew you were a Christian, but at some point, maybe in high school or in college or right after college, uh, the Lord uh, deepened your, your faith, your understanding of the gospel, the doctrines of grace, uh, opened your eyes to things that you perhaps had heard all your life, but now you saw them in a new and a fresh way. And it was through that experience of, of deepening your knowledge of sin, your knowledge of his grace, that he perhaps called you into ministry or called you in some different direction in your life. Well, that's the way it was for, for Leighton Wilson. It was January of 1831 when he entered Columbia Theological Seminary. He was a member of the first graduating class of six students. Uh, there was a, a deep interest in foreign missions from the very beginning of the seminary. And as soon as he arrived on campus, a fellow classmate named James Merrick, who would eventually become a missionary to Muslims in Iran, uh, Persia, uh, they formed a Society of Missionary Inquiry uh, through the influence of Professor George Howe at the seminary, 
as well as Merrick and Adger up in Princeton, that Wilson's heart was stirred to be a missionary. He wrote his sister in January 1832, I have looked at the subject now for more than a year, and there appears to me stronger reasons for my becoming a missionary than for many who go. And one of considerable importance is that our family, those dearest to me on earth, have been made the subjects of grace already. Are we not laid under infinite obligations to him who has loved us with an everlasting love? And ought I now to hesitate about obeying his command, go teach all nations? I do not think of going away to a foreign country because there is nothing to be done at home, but because there is more to be done in those places where the Christian religion is unknown. If I had them at my disposal, he says, I could put more than 100 ministers to work in South Carolina, but I could set 500,000 to work in the missionary field. And so at the end of 1832, the 23-year-old set his face to go to that mission field. He began to communicate with the ABCFM, which, as we said, was the primary sending agency for Presbyterian missionaries in those days. Uh, for some time, that board had been wanting to send missionaries to Africa, particularly young men from the South, uh, thought that they would do better in the climate. And so Leighton was a perfect match. Not only had he grown up in the South, he had grown up around the sons and daughters of Africa there in South Carolina. Uh, as well, his uncle, Robert James, uh, had demonstrated a profound interest in the spiritual condition of the slaves of South Carolina, and he played a large role in Leighton's own heart to reach Africans for Christ. In a letter to his future wife, Jane Baird, in December of 1832, he writes, I cannot be induced to turn away my eyes from Africa. My heart is fixed upon that injured, neglected people, and I rejoice that yours is also. If Englishmen can penetrate the heart of the country for wealth, shall we not go for the love of Christ? Now, though Leighton desired to go, his family uh, thought it was not a wise thing, was not the best idea. His father in particular, uh, the thought of seeing his son leave uh, for Africa was difficult. In another letter to Jane in December of 1832, he told her that his father regarded his determination to go to Africa as a judgment upon himself for having loved this boy too much. Egbert Watson Smith, who was the PCUS Secretary of Foreign Missions from 1911 to 1932, tells the great story of, of Leighton returning home that winter break as his father still refused to give his consent. And Smith writes this, Father, said Leighton, would you be willing to go into the room and pray with me? And so they began. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Smith says the Father could not go beyond that petition. Brought face to face with the world embracing affections and purposes of God, he could not hold to any little contrary ambition of his own. Slipping his arm around his son's shoulder, he told him he could go. Following several months in the north in 1833, studying Arabic at Andover Seminary and getting to know the ABCFM leaders, uh, he was ordained in September of 1833 by Harmony Presbytery at his home church. In November of that year, he sailed to Liberia with the Maryland Colonization Society to explore possible sites for a mission. Uh, the society was about to plant a colony at Cape Palmas in the town now known as Harper. Uh, it was 250 miles south of Monrovia, the, uh, the capital of Liberia. Uh, and he wanted, uh, the colony wanted to plant a, a mission there as well, along with the colony. Uh, Wilson on this journey concluded that that site was indeed uh, the most suitable spot for a mission. And so he returns to the States and to his beloved Jane in April of 1834. I've mentioned Jane several times. Let's hear a little bit about her. It was toward the end of 1832 uh, that having failed to win the heart of John Bailey Adger's sister, Margaret, who ended up marrying Thomas Smythe, uh, he uh, then began to court Miss El Jane Elizabeth Baird. Uh, she was from Savannah, Georgia. Uh, she was five years younger than Leighton was, so in 1832 she was uh, 18. Uh, she was the granddaughter of General Lachlan McIntosh, a noted American Revolution uh, hero. Uh, she was also a cousin of Charles Hodge. Uh, Jane and her younger sister Margaret were orphaned uh, when she was 13, and after their conversions, the Lord laid it on their hearts uh, to be missionaries to the Sandwich Islands, now known as the island of Hawaii. Uh, DeBose, uh, Leighton Wilson's biographer, tells us 
that when these two young ladies applied to be sent by the American board, uh, they were not accepted because at that point it was deemed unwise to send unmarried ladies to the foreign field. So as you can imagine, they uh, quickly caught the eye of men who sensed God's call to be missionaries also. Uh, Margaret ended up marrying James Eckerd. Uh, They went to India. Leighton Wilson pursued Jane, and they were married on May 22nd, 1834. Leighton was 25, and, and Jane was 20. Unfortunately, in God's providence, they were never able to have any children, uh, perhaps the result of the, of the malarial fevers that they experienced upon their arrival in Africa and at multiple times uh, throughout their 18 years there. Uh, but also in God's providence, uh, they had uh, the blessing of having hundreds of students uh, in the, the African schools that they started and planted there in Africa. And, and after returning to the States, uh, they were able to adopt two daughters, one in the 1850s, a seven-year-old whose mother had passed away on the mission field and the father uh, was not able to, to take care of her. And so he sends her back across the ocean to, 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 the, to Leighton and Jane Wilson and asks them to adopt her and to take her in as, as their own. And they did that. And then later in 1870, another orphan pastor's daughter named Alice Johnson uh, was adopted by them and, and she cared for them in their old age. And so the Lord was gracious to them, uh, even though they themselves could not have their own children. So after they're married in May of 1834, they sail for Liberia that November. Uh, Their first six months or so were spent getting acclimated to their new home, just another way of saying they suffered greatly and regularly from malarial fevers. At one point in March of 1835, Leighton nearly died. In August 1836, he writes this, since I wrote last, our general health has been good and we have been subjected to little or no inconvenience on account of sickness. When I say good health, You must not understand me as speaking of what you would call in America good health, but good African health. We have frequent attacks of chills and fevers, but we're not confined to our rooms for more than a few hours and are able the next day to resume our duties. There at Cape Palmas, they spent seven years preaching the gospel to the villages around the mission, planning a church of 30 to 40 members, establishing a school for the native children, learning the Grebo language, reducing it to writing, printing a grammar, a dictionary, and the Gospels of Matthew and John. Unfortunately, the conflicts between the native Africans and the African-American colonists who had come with the Maryland Colonization Society uh, had a negative impact on the work of the mission. Uh, And so Wilson and the other missionaries who had joined him uh, by that point ended up relocating their work to the Gabon, uh, south of Liberia, Uh, in the summer of 1842, near modern-day Libreville uh, on the Gabon Estuary, the northern part of the country. Uh, Here, he ministered for 10 years. Uh, So he's got seven years there in uh, Liberia, uh, 10 years in the Gabon. He doesn't take his first furlough uh, until 1847, uh, the first time he returned back home. Uh, There in the Gabon, he preached the gospel. He mastered uh, both the Mpongwe language and the Batanga language. He printed parts of the Bible in in Mpongwe. He explored the western African coastlands. Now, obviously, I'm I'm running over uh, such an important part of his life there uh, in uh, Africa. And so, again, I encourage you to to spend time looking and reading uh, more about Leighton Wilson and his work in Africa. It was the summer of 1852 Uh, when, due to severe liver issues, Leighton and Jane decided to come home for another furlough uh, to rest among family, to see doctors about his medical condition. Uh, The doctors recommended that he spend some time in the mountain air that fall, uh, and then in the winter he traveled back home to South Carolina where he was able to spend time with John Adger uh, to see the work that he and John Lafayette Gerardo had started in Charleston for the slaves, uh, the work that would soon become Zion Presbyterian Church. During that season, he was regaining his strength. He thought that he might be able to go back to Africa, but there was a a serious setback when his liver illness rose up again, and he realized that that his time in Africa was was done. His presbytery sent him as a commissioner to the 1853 General Assembly, and while he was there, uh, he was nominated and elected to be the third secretary of the Presbyterian Board of Foreign Missions in New York City, along with Walter Lowry and his son, uh, John Lowry. Imagine the culture shock uh, to go from a a thatched cottage on coastal Africa one year into a large house in upper Manhattan the next year. Uh, During the eight years that he spent in this role as assistant secretary, he he served as the recording clerk, as it were. He uh, edited the home and foreign record for the board. 
He dealt with logistics and budgets. He visited churches and presbyteries and synods and general assemblies. He hosted missionaries on furloughs. He visited seminaries, uh, seeking to recruit men to the foreign field. Uh, He was the primary contact for the missionaries in Africa as well as for the Indian nations in the United States. Uh, In the late 1850s, when a majority of the the board of foreign missions was opposed to sending Asheville Green Simonton to Brazil on the grounds that Romanism was already the established religion, it would be a waste of of time and effort and money, Uh, Dr. Wilson advocated strongly for sending Simonton, and the board changed its mind. Uh, Though Simonton died of malaria in 1867, only after after only eight years on the field, uh, he is still... Uh, considered the father of Presbyterianism uh, in Brazil. The mission continued to prosper even after his death. Uh, And so Wilson's time in New York, that that, that decade of the 1850s, gave him valuable experience for his life's final chapter in the South. The storms of war were gathering over the nation after the election of Abraham Lincoln in November of 1860, and Wilson was struggling mightily within. On the one hand, he desired and prayed for earnestly the preservation of the entire union, Uh, yet to Dr. Dabney's chagrin, uh, he had sympathies for the secession movement in South Carolina. In February 1861, with tears and trembling, he spoke these words to a friend. My brother, we know now what is before us. You see the great power and the tremendous forces of the North, their intense hatred of secession, and the fixed determination to crush the South if they do not yield to the federal government. I pray God to avert the storm and save us from the hands of civil war. But if it comes, my mind is made up. I will go and suffer with my people. Now, in some ways, Wilson's choice is understandable. He was a South Carolinian. Uh, Most of his family was here in this great state. But when you consider Wilson's previous opinions and actions regarding slavery, you see how complicated, how conflicted that decision must have been. In a letter to Jane during their courtship in the early 1830s, he writes this, I hold that every human being who is capable of self-government and would be happier in a state of freedom ought to be free. I am not, however, a friend of immediate and universal emancipation for the simple reason that all are not ready for freedom and would be worse off in that than in their present condition. And so in line with these views, Wilson did free the slaves that he and Jane inherited from the death of their parents. Jane owned 30 slaves after her parents died. And before she and Leighton left for Africa, they made preparations for their eventual emancipation. Uh, South Carolina and Georgia at that time had laws on the books that made it illegal for newly freed slaves to remain in the state. And so the Wilsons left it up to the slaves themselves to decide whether they wanted to join the colonization movement to Liberia, remain in America, but go to the north, or remain enslaved by choice in order to remain in South Carolina. In the case of Jane's slaves, the vast majority chose to sail to Liberia along with Leighton and Jane. By legal inheritance from his deceased mother, Leighton himself had become the owner of two slave boys named John and Jesse when he turned 21. When he leaves for Africa, they are 11 and 5 years old, and Wilson did not want to free them, and and because of the South Carolina laws, forced them to leave South Carolina, forced them to be removed from their mother, uh, who at the time belonged to his father, and so he leaves them enslaved. Several times after he arrives in Africa, uh, he desired to freedom. He desired John the older to, to move north or to come to Africa, but John refused. He refused to leave South Carolina. Uh, during Wilson's time in Liberia, as abolitionism was on the rise in the United States, uh, his circumstances become an issue uh, with the supporters of the American board, which, is, again, is based in the north, in New England. Uh, Leighton has to defend what he had done to try to free his slaves. He was denounced as a vile slaveholder in the north, Uh, But in the South, he was accused of being an abolitionist. In a letter to Rufus Anderson, the secretary of the American board, he writes this, I desire no profit in any form from their labors. Those who immigrated to Africa were brought here at private cost, involving an expense of several thousand dollars. The only object I have in alluding to this fact, he says, is to show that I am not a slaveholder for the sake of gain, And that so far as I have funds to dispose of in the cause of humanity, 
they have been appropriated chiefly to promote the happiness and the comfort of those who have been in bondage. I do not see it my duty to use force, he says. John and Jesse have the liberty of choosing for themselves, and I have endeavored to communicate such light and information as will enable them to choose wisely. This seems to me the best liberty that is in my power to confer. If I withdraw my protection from them and allow them to become public property, it seems to be very questionable whether I'm in the line of duty. Eventually, in 1843, he did set the two boys free, but he, he wrote his father, if John and Jesse would go to one of the free states, I would be greatly pleased. But if they prefer to remain on the plantation and work as heretofore, let them do so, but with the understanding that they may leave whenever they choose to do so. They did choose to remain on the Wilson plantation, but they lived quietly as free men, uh, so the authorities would not send them away. While Wilson served in Africa, his opposition to slavery only grew, in particular uh, because of what he saw and witnessed firsthand with regard to the evil of the slave trade. Though illegal since 1807 in Britain and 1808 in America, the slave trade still persisted in large part because of the Western powers who created the market for slaves and also because of the Africans who were eager to sell their enemies or even their friends into slavery for financial gain. In 1836, he described speaking uh, to two African men who had just sold a slave, and he, he said, I asked them if they did not think it wrong to capture and sell their fellow men as slaves. And they said, no, no white man has told us that it's wrong. And Wilson writes, how affecting to trace the footsteps of white men in Africa. I have reference, he says, to slave dealers who form the great majority of those who have visited her shores. Their footsteps are to be traced in wars and bloodshed and tumults and distress and misery and everything that can degrade and render savage the heart of man. In 1842, he writes his wife Jane from the Gabon, I have visited all the settlements on the river in this immediate vicinity. There was one scene in these excursions which particularly affected my heart. I refer to the interior of an African slave factory on the opposite side of the river. I cannot enter into detail, but suffice it to say my curiosity will never prompt me again to visit a similar scene of human degradation. Think of 430 naked savages of both sexes, of all ages, sizes, and conditions, brought together in one enclosure, chained together in gangs of 20, 30, or 40, and all compelled to sleep on the same platform, eat out of the same tub, and in almost every respect live like so many swine. More than this, on the middle passage, they must have quarters still more circumscribed and live on much scantier fare. God reigns, and this vile traffic in human beings must come to an end. Now, certainly many felt as Wilson did in those days, but very few had the opportunity to impact the slave trade like he did. One of the wonderful episodes in his labors as a missionary was how the Lord used him to bring an end to the slave trade. In 1851, the British were planning to withdraw uh, their fleet from the African coast, the, the ships that were, were seeking to keep slave trading at bay. Wilson heard of this, and he writes a, a paper uh, on this topic and, and mails it to a wealthy friend in London who then sent it uh, to a British lord. In this paper, Wilson uh, demonstrates that the squadron had accomplished much, uh, and rather than uh, taking it away, it, it should be continued and it should be strengthened. Uh, he, he advocated for the fastest ships to be sent to the African coast, faster than the slave ships, so that they could not outrun the British ships. Uh, he advocated for more ships to be sent to the African coast. Eventually, 10,000 copies of his pamphlet were published and distributed, and his recommendations were heeded. And yet, in spite of all his resistance, all his antipathy to slavery over those decades, he still chose to suffer with his people. The 1861 General Assembly meets in Philadelphia in May, just a month after Fort Sumter had been fired upon. The Civil War had already begun. Dr. Wilson was present. Uh, though not as a commissioner, since his South Carolina Presbytery uh, had not sent any commissioners. He was present when Dr. Gardner Spring, who happened to be his and Jane's very own pastor, uh, offered up the fateful resolution uh, that uh, passed by a vote of 154 to 66 and led to the withdrawal of 47 Southern Presbyteries. Wilson and Jane make their way south 
In August of 1861, we find him in Atlanta at a convention to plan the formation of the Presbyterian Church in the Confederate States of America, eventually the PCUS. Wilson's desire was to make sure that the new denomination was fully committed to missions, particularly foreign missions. The problem, of course, was that there was a federal blockade preventing any ship from leaving the cities of Savannah or Charleston or Mobile or New Orleans. Fortunately, the nations were in the bounds of the southern states. Wilson already had a history with them, with the Choctaws and the Cherokee and the Creek and the Chickasaw Indian tribes and what would eventually become Oklahoma. Uh, When he had been working with the old school church's board of missions, he had been the the spokesman, the representative, the contact for these Indian tribes. The board had sent missionaries to those tribes, uh, but with the start of the war, they had gone back north. Now Wilson says, this is our call as a southern church to send missionaries, to be involved in bringing the gospel uh, to the tribes. And so he goes in October 1861, in between that August meeting and the first assembly, he goes to visit these tribes and he pledges the support of the Southern Presbyterian Church. When the first General Assembly meets in Augusta, Georgia on December the 4th, 1861. Uh, Wilson is elected as the secretary of this new foreign missions committee. Uh, It's located in Columbia. Uh, The committee of domestic missions had been placed in New Orleans, but uh, with the capture of that city in 1863, all of a sudden uh, that committee cannot do its work. And so Wilson also becomes the the, the, the secretary, the, the, the coordinator uh, of uh, the national missions, domestic missions as well. Uh, he immediately makes plans to send uh, pastors and chaplains to every brigade in the Confederate Army. After the war is over, uh, with all number of sons and fathers of the Southern Presbyterian Church having died in the war, church is destitute. Wilson steps up. Uh, Hampton DeBose, his biographer, calls him the Southern Chalmers of the Disruption. He writes this, No sooner did the bugle call to battle cease to be heard than he seized the gospel trumpet and with its clarion note summoned the church to action. He was a cheerful, hopeful leader and his presence inspired faith and courage. He breathed upon the church the spirit of consecration. He awoke the slumbering energies of the people to fresh resolve. He gladdened the low-spirited and encouraged the faith. Combining until 1872 the functions of secretary both of home and foreign missions, his office became the connectional center of the church. As a corresponding agent, he was a chief director of her vast interest. In the southern synods, no one has ever equaled him in the power for good he exerted. And we believe it is impossible in the future for any man to obtain the position of commanding influence that he exercised during the 10 years following our civil struggle. For those 24 years that he served the Southern Church from 1861 to 1884, his impact for foreign missions in particular was powerful. At a time when it it would have seemed that all the effort and all the money and all the focus should have been on rebuilding the church at home, Leighton Wilson insisted and ensured that there would be attention on foreign missions. He led the assembly in bringing the gospel to the lost abroad. The work to the Indian tribes was continued. Uh, He sent a man named Elias Inslee, who had already previously been a missionary to China. He sends him back to China. Two missionaries are sent to Brazil. A female teacher living near Wilson's hometown named Mrs. Christina Ruzzini, a native of Italy, was sent to work as a school teacher with the Waldensian church there. A man named Henry Pratt went as a missionary with his family to Colombia in 1869. Michael Kalapathakis, a native of Greece who had been converted in the 1830s by Presbyterian missionaries and had become a Presbyterian pastor in the state of Virginia, returns to Greece as a missionary in 1873. A man named Anthony Graybill and his wife were sent to Matamoros, Mexico in 1874. And in 1885, as he's laying down the mantle of secretary, a missionary is sent to Japan. Unfortunately, his dream of of seeing missionaries sent from the southern church to Africa only comes to fruition after he dies, when Samuel Lapsley and William Shepard are sent to the Congo in 1890. Through his years as the Secretary of Foreign Missions, he visited all these various missions. He corresponded with the missionaries. He published the newspaper called The Missionary, 
He recruited new missionaries at the seminaries. He preached among the churches. He raised money for the work through all the ups and downs of post-war financial depressions and yellow fever pandemics. One quote especially highlights the heart of Leighton Wilson at this time. He writes to Hampton DeBose, It is a hard thing, my dear DeBose, to fill the office of a foreign secretary, to have to stand between a dying world and an indifferent, hesitating church. After a trip to Brazil in 1875, Wilson realized that he needed to be living in a major port city where steamships from the nations came and went and where he could secure a better financial footing for the work of missions. And so in 1876, he and Jane left home once more, this time for Baltimore. He spent the last eight years of his ministry there in Baltimore. Eventually his body and his mind declined to the point where he realized it was time to resign. In 1884, he and Jane moved back to South Carolina In May of 1885, he submitted his resignation to the General Assembly that was meeting in Houston, Texas. Jane Bayard Wilson passed away two months after that, on July 16, 1885, at the age of 71. Nearly a year later, on July 13, 1886, at the age of 77, the Lord took John Layton Wilson home as well. DeBose beautifully summarizes his ministry Though loving the church in every branch of her work, yet to him, the one great cause, we might say the one cause, was foreign missions. And trying to awake the energies of God's people to the lost condition of the heathen, all could see that the Savior's last command was the moving spring of his life and labors. It was this intensity of interest and the cause of the world's salvation that made his words a power. The great principle which acted as the lever to his ministry was, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. DeBose says, What the work of the Southern Presbyterian Church and the regions of the unbelievers may become in the generations to come, I now hath not seen. But this we may without fear assert, that the place of the father of her foreign missionary work may be assigned to her first secretary. It was his to awaken, to inspire, to plant, to carry onwards, till she had strengthened her stakes and enlarged her coast. As he remarked to the writer, my little universe is foreign missions. So this is John Layton Wilson. There's so much that we can learn from his life and from his ministry, but as we move into this second part of my talk, I I want us to highlight four lessons from his life and from his ministry. And the first is this, and if you can stick this slide up on the, the screen, we're about to read a quote that I want you to see with your own eyes. The first lesson that I want us to learn is this, the vital importance of a church's commitment to foreign missions, foreign missions in particular. It was Wednesday, December 11th, a week into the first General Assembly of the Southern Presbyterian Church, an assembly, uh, you should note, that, that lasted for two weeks. All right, we, we kind of get tired, don't we, after you know, three days, but they went for two weeks. And there in the middle of the first week, Uh, The Committee on Foreign Missions that had been appointed by the moderator, Benjamin Morgan Palmer, gave its report. Leighton Wilson was not the one giving the report, but he was on the committee and undoubtedly had a a large hand in writing the report. And I want you to read along with me, as I read out loud, read with me uh, this last paragraph. He writes this, Finally, the General Assembly desires distinctly and deliberately to inscribe on our church's banner as she now first unfurls it to the world, in immediate connection with the headship of her Lord, his last command, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Regarding this as the great end, the great telos, the great purpose of her organization and obedience to it as the indispensable condition of her Lord's promised presence. And as one great comprehensive object, a proper conception of whose vast magnitude and grandeur is the only thing which in connection with the love of Christ can ever sufficiently arouse her energies and develop her resources so as to cause her to carry on with a vigor and efficiency which true fealty to her Lord demands those other agencies necessary to her internal growth and home prosperity. The claims of this cause ought therefore to be kept constantly before the minds of our people and pressed upon their consciences. And every minister owes it to his people and to a perishing world to give such instruction on this subject as he is able. 
And to this end, the monthly concert, the monthly concert of prayer, ought to be devoutly observed by every church on the first Sabbath of each month for the purpose of missionary instruction as well as prayer. And it would be well to accompany their prayers with their offerings. To the same end, the assembly earnestly enjoins upon all our ministers and ruling elders and deacons and Sabbath school teachers, and especially upon parents, particular attention to our precious youth and training them to feel a deep interest in this work and not only to form habits of systematic benevolence, but to feel and respond to the claims of Jesus upon them for personal service in the field. And should a Sabbath school paper be established, I've never seen one of those, I'm assuming that they were established, Uh, should one be established, they recommend that at least one page be exclusively devoted to this subject of missions. What a glorious statement. As the first assembly is unfurling its banner, they're putting a stake in the ground that foreign missions will be at the very heart of its labor, the heart of its ministry. The assembly approves this statement. I'm sure it was held with varying degrees of enthusiasm across the body, but it is remarkable to note that this was on their heart as they are sending their sons off to war. There's no question that Wilson believed this statement with all his heart. Particularly that last part, or the part in the middle. If you'll go back to the bolded statement, I want you to see uh, this, this statement again. It, it's strangely worded, right? It's worded as 19th century Victorians were wont to write. Uh, it, it's lots of complicated sen- sentences. But, but this is what it's saying. It's only a proper conception of the vast magnitude and grandeur of Jesus' great commission and love for Jesus that can ever sufficiently arouse the church's energies and develop her resources to cause her to carry on all the other ministries that are necessary to internal growth with vigor and efficiency, which fealty to the Lord Jesus demands. Do you believe that, brothers and sisters? Do you believe that a passion for foreign missions is the motive force for all the church's other ministries? Do you believe that if you want to see how a church, whether a local church or a denomination, is doing, or what its future prospects hold, you ought to look at their foreign missions budget. You ought to look at their foreign missions program and activity. Who are they supporting? How are they supporting them? How many missionaries are they sending forth? To what degree does foreign missions have a hold on the heart of that church? Pastor, are you keeping the claims of missions before your people and your preaching and your praying? Do you have a prayer meeting, a concert of prayer, a monthly concert for missions? We've started this recently in our church and what a blessing it is before evening worship on the first Sunday of every month to gather together and to pray through our missionaries, the ministries that we support, both foreign, national, local, and the General Assembly uh, committees as the PCA I would commend that to you. I would love if all the churches that you represent would go home and that we would know that on the first Sunday of every month, right before the evening worship service, we are gathering together to pray for the spread of the gospel. We're praying for revival. We're praying for the, the gospel to work not only in our own hearts, right, but in our nation, in the world. We're praying for the Lord to send out labors into the harvest field. The monthly concert was something that the 19th century Presbyterian church was committed to. It began in the 18th century. Jonathan Edwards' work on uh, the the, the importance of prayer. The church, both in Scotland and in America, was committed to this monthly concert. I would love to see the Lord revive that again in our churches. What about your children? As this statement mentioned at the end, are we seeking to see our children grow in a, a heart and a love for foreign missions? What about our new members? Listen to this quote this statement from one of those uh, recommendations that John Holt Rice gave to the GA back in 1831. He said this, that it be earnestly recommended to all church sessions and hereafter admitting new members to the churches distinctly to state to candidates for admissions that if they join the church, they join a community, the object of which is the conversion of the heathen world and to impress on their minds a deep sense of their obligation as redeemed sinners to cooperate in the accomplishment of this great object of Christ's mission to the world. When we receive new members into our churches, do we tell them that? Welcome. You have joined an organization whose goal is to convert the world. 
And you, whether you go or whether you stay and pray and give and send, every member has a role to play in this grand and glorious work. The point that this General Assembly statement was making was that if this is the case, if we have this vision of what God is doing through us around the world, then all the other ministries, all the internal ministries, are going to be strong, are going to be vigorous. Right? They will be growing because the Lord blesses the labor at home as we send forth the laborers around the world. So that's the first lesson I think we draw, the vital importance of a church's commitment to foreign missions in particular. Second, the nations are here in America. At that first assembly, Wilson did give a report. He gave a report about his journey that summer out to the Native American Indian tribes. In his 1881 memorial address on the history of Columbia Presbyterian Seminary and missions, he notes in that article that during the war and immediately after the war, the Indian missions were all that the church could do. But they did it. They did what they could do. They realized that in God's providence, they didn't have to travel over the oceans to bring the gospel to four nations. The nations were here in their very bounds. This has always been known and seen by Presbyterians and even Congregationalists. Going back to the 1600s, John Eliot, the Congregationalist Puritan, David Brainerd in the 1700s, to whom did they minister? The Native Americans here in America. Gideon Blackburn was a pioneer Presbyterian missionary among the Cherokees at Chickamauga in Tennessee in the early 1800s. Cyrus Kingsbury went both to the Cherokees and then to the Choctaw in Mississippi. He went with them as they were forced to migrate out to Oklahoma in the 1830s. When Wilson writes that article in 1881, he tells us that among the Choctaws and the Chickasaws at that time, there were 27 churches, 1,200 members, three ministers from the United States, 10 native ministers, and young men training for the ministry. I've been convicted even working on this presentation that in Mississippi, we have the Choctaw Indian tribe. There's a reservation. Our church has taken mission trips to the Yakima Indian Reservation, but we've never taken a trip to the Choctaw Reservation, about two hours away. The nations are here. And whether you have Indian tribes in your own backyard like we do or not, the nations have come to America, brothers and sisters. We know this. We see it every day. International college student outreaches, ESL ministries. If you're in the PCA, RUF International, right? Spanish-speaking Sunday school classes and services, these ought to be viewed as a part of our foreign missions efforts. Look around you, wherever you live. See that the nations have come here. See the opportunities you have to minister the gospel to the lost to those who've never heard the name of Jesus, who've never visited a Christian church. You don't have to go across the world. You can do it even here in your own backyard. Third, Leighton Wilson teaches us how to do missions on the ground. Now, I'll be the first to say I've never been a foreign missionary. I have not reflected as deeply as some of you who are on how missions ought to be done, how missionaries ought to be doing their work. And so I, I give these comments less as, less as authoritative prescription, more as uh, exemplary description based on Leighton Wilson's life and ministry. But I believe that, that what we see in Leighton's ministry is uh, it comports with what the Bible teaches about how to do ministry in general. Uh, so here's what Leighton Wilson would say to us about how we should do missions. First, he would say, preach the word and plant churches, especially and eventually with native pastors. November 25th, 1843, he writes this from the Gabon. Preaching the gospel, we make our leading business. We maintain, we maintain stated preaching at six different places and occasional services at a still greater number. By 1847, he can write this. Besides the villages nearer to the principal station, where the word of God has been dispensed steadily, there are 15 or 20 settlements more remote where there has been occasional preaching, so that the people over a considerable extent of country have been initiated into the first principles of Christianity, and thus the way has been prepared for more vigorous, systematic, and extended operations hereafter. Wilson's ministry was word-centered. It was gospel-centered, Christ-centered. 
He saw the mission in Cape Palmas and in the Gabon as the eventual hub and the center of a wheel, a headquarters from which a line of mission stations could extend far into the interior of Africa, converting the lost, educating native preachers to go forth to the word of life in all directions. And so Wilson spent much of his time exploring, traveling into the wilds of Africa, preaching the gospel, looking for strategic locations to plant future churches. Second, Wilson would say, educate the children. Education wasn't just for those that he wanted to train up for ministry. A key part of his mission was a school for the native children. Not only was this highly valued by the native population, it was also a way to preach the gospel uh, to the youngsters, to the youngest, the most malleable of the village. And, and as we see even today, when you win uh, children to Christ, you often end up winning their parents to Christ. Leighton and Jane loved children. The Bose even devotes an entire chapter of his memoirs of Wilson to this fact. Do we see the importance of children on the missions field bringing the gospel to the lost, to boys and girls? Third, as we've already heard this morning from Dr. Hamilton, missionaries must learn, must learn the language, must preach in it, must translate the Bible into it. Wilson, as we've said, has learned, he learned multiple languages and dialects in Africa. In the Gabon, he writes this, besides various elementary books, they have prepared a small hymn book of 48 pages, a volume of simple sermons of 72 pages, a volume of extracts from the New Testament of 82 pages, a volume of Old Testament history. All these are in the Mpongwe language, printed in tol tolerably good style, he says, by a native boy of our own training, who's not more than 16 years of age. We prepared for the press a grammar, an extended vocabulary of the Mpongwe, also a small vocabulary and a few familiar sentences in the Batonga language. His linguistic skill, just like Dr. Burns, as we all heard this, this morning, was amazing. It goes without saying, as Dr. Hamilton said, right, that the most effective missionaries are going to preach the gospel in the vernacular of those to whom they seek to reach. Wilson would also tell us this, learn the culture. Learn the culture. Right? Not just the language of those who are lost, but learn all you can about them. Wilson's travels up and down the coast of Africa right, into the interior of Africa uh, led him eventually to publish that book lauded by David Livingstone entitled Western Africa. It covered geography and climate and flora and fauna, culture and ethnography, languages, history, religion, the slave trade, Christian missions, the, the Western church's duty to continue to bring the gospel to Africa. And he wasn't learning these things just to, to gather information, but so that he could use it for the sake of, of gaining a hearing for Jesus Christ among the lost. James Merrick, who was Wilson's classmate, who so greatly influenced his decision to become a, Merrick, uh, a missionary, writes this in his farewell address when he goes off to Persia. He writes, It is said of Alexander the Great that when a youth he made himself acquainted with the roads and the whole topography of the Persian Empire so that in his intended invasion he might occupy the most commanding ground and have all the advantages of situation in his favor. He who regards the map of the world with a missionary eye, who studies geography with a view of subduing all nations unto Christ, marks every vantage position with an interest which the ambitious warrior and the curious traveler never felt. We study geography for the glory of King Jesus. Whether the animal, vegetable, or mineral kingdom, whether the manners and customs, or the arts and the sciences and the politics and the religions, missionaries must seek to know as much as possible to reach as many as possible. This is part and parcel of the missionary spirit to know those to whom we minister. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, becoming all things to all men, so that by all means we might save some. And then last, how do we do missions? Leighton Wilson would tell us, do good to all men. His ministry was a, a life of service to those in need. The sick, the suffering, the needy, the destitute, the, the, the traveler, the sailor, the widow, the orphan, they all found refuge under the roof of Leighton and Jane Wilson. Right? Ministries of mercy were part and parcel with his mission work, caring for the body as well as the soul, whether as a doctor, showing hospitality, providing financially for the poor, or even as a mediator between warring individuals, warring tribes, warring groups, colonists and natives, uh, natives and countries like Britain and France, 
He worked for, he exhorted to justice among even those who did not know the Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, the fourth lesson we can learn from Leighton Wilson, a theme of which we've already heard much already, uh, missionaries and all in ministry, every Christian, you will suffer. You will suffer. Leighton writes Jane during their courtship, our lives in that country must be laborious indeed. We must be subject to many trials and deprivations, but Jane, this is food for the children of God. Later he writes, our lives may and probably will be shortened, but such is the transcendent importance of that mission that it seems to me our duty to commence it, even though there be no possibility of our living more than 10 years. Obviously in God's providence, they lived more than 10 years. They lived a full life, but they suffered. They suffered the scorn and skepticism of their family. They suffered uh, the, all the travails of the African climate, the mosquitoes that caused malaria. They suffered the, the water that led to dysentery. They had conflicts with the colonial leaders. They had conflicts with the, the, the native population. They had conflicts with the, the countries that, that owned and the, the, the ter- you know, that, that had possession of those territories there in Africa. He writes in Western Africa that in all of his travels, he never thought it was necessary to actually arm himself. He never was in a situation where he needed to have a weapon. And yet there were times where he encountered cannibals in the inland parts of Africa. There were situations where the, the, the tension between the natives and the African-American colonists or the natives and the French armies were such that he was caught in the middle, was in danger. There was the emotional suffering of watching missionary after missionary after missionary die because of the fevers of malaria. Half of those who joined them in Africa ended up dying of illness. He suffered. And if you are called to serve the Lord, particularly overseas, you will, you must suffer. The work of missions cannot proceed without suffering and sacrifice. And why is this? Because we follow a suffering servant. We are united. We are priests. And Jesus Christ, the priest who laid down his life, was a sacrifice. And if Jesus, as Dr. Thornwell put it, if Jesus by his sacrifice purchased redemption, so we by our sacrifices must make that redemption known. Just as there are difficulties to accomplish the salvation of sinners, there are difficulties that we will, that we must encounter in spreading the salvation abroad. Dr. Thornwell again, he says, let us gird ourselves for the sacrifices. Let us follow in Jesus' tracks. We shall know them by the blood. So this is John Leighton Wilson and his wife Jane. I'm thankful that none of you in this room, none of you watching online can say that he's no longer known to you or unknown to you. You know him, you've heard about him. I hope that, that you continue to get to know him, continue to read about him and all the other 19th century missionary pioneers, both in Africa in America, Scotland, England, all the other countries that were sending missionaries out in the 19th century. Brothers and sisters, it is incumbent upon us as the people of God today that we learn and get to know the forefathers, the foremothers in the faith. Let me close with a quote by Hampton DeBose, again, uh, Wilson's biographer. He writes this, It is fitting that we study the lives and characters of these great men and women in order that we may be incited to greater activity, and to more earnest consecration in the Master's service. It is also due to the generations yet to come that we tell of the ardent piety, the heroic deeds, the manifold toils and trials of of these early missionaries so that they too, our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, might have a strong faith in the power of the gospel to convert the world. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for the power of your gospel. We thank you, Lord, for those who have gone before us, who are now a part of that great cloud of witnesses who cheer us on as we fix our eyes upon Jesus and run this race with endurance. Oh Lord, we pray that you would help us, O oh Lord, to walk in, in the tracks of you, Lord Jesus, but also in the tracks of, of our fathers and mothers who have gone before us. Oh Lord, we thank you for the call that you've laid upon their lives, the call that you've laid upon our lives. We ask Oh, Lord Jesus, that you would continue to send forth men and women, boys and girls, give them a heart of of missionary zeal. Lord, we pray uh, that you would help us, oh Lord, to love you with all of our heart, to love you and to love the lost. We pray, oh Father, that you would give to us a great gratitude for men like Leighton Wilson, women like Jane Wilson, 
Lord, we ask that you would give to us a knowledge of those who have gone before us, that we might walk in their footsteps, so we might follow their example, Lord, so that we might give you gratitude, give you thanks and praise for what you have done in the past, what you can do now, what you will do in the future. Lord, this entire work, this entire missionary endeavor, it is all of grace. It is all of your power. Lord, that's our hope. That's our confidence. And we ask that you would continue to glorify your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, through us. We pray this in his name. Amen.